Isn't it good to be in God's presence today? It really is good to be in God's presence. As Pastor Sean said already today, we give every single one of you a massive uh, warm welcome. For those who may not know who I am, my name's uh, John. It's my privilege to be uh, one of the pastors here as well. And it's so good to see you. The sun is shining outside, but you've chosen to come into a building. Some of you have chosen to watch online, but whoever, wherever you are today, we just welcome you. It's so good um, to see you. I'm sure that many of you be aware today that this morning we are concluding our series in the Community Bible Series. For those who have been part of Rugby Elim for the past few months, you know that we've been journeying through this incredible part of the New Testament, the New Testament, that talks about the love, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for the past 16 weeks, we've been journeying through the whole of the New Testament together. And today, we're going to bring, as it were, that to a close. But we're going to celebrate the fact that we've been doing that together. And the great thing is, at the end of our service today, we've got cakes for all those people who want a cake. Because we want to celebrate the fact that together, we've journeyed through the New Testament and what a journey it has been from where we first commenced, right there in the Gospel of Luke, not in the Gospel of Matthew, but in the Gospel of Luke, and then concluded in the book of Revelation. And the thing about the community Bible experience was that it was never supposed to be a race. And therefore, we want to encourage those of you who've not finished yet reading through the whole of the New Testament to keep on going, to keep on reading. And if you find somebody who says, you know what, I'm still in the book of Luke, say, well done for reading thus far. And we want to encourage every single one of you, for those who finished reading the New Testament, to keep on exploring God's Word. Somebody this morning said to me already that their intention is to go back to the very beginning of Luke again and begin to read it afresh in a new way over the next maybe 16 weeks. We believe that God speaks through his word, that God speaks through his word, because God's word is a word that is alive, it's active and still speaks into the heart of men and women today. And one of the things that's been so great over the past 16 weeks is that we haven't just done that on our own, but we've done that in community, where people on WhatsApp groups have been asking each other the question, what does that mean? As people have gathered in smaller groups, be it in a, a formal life group setting or an informal gathering, again, exploring together the things that God has been speaking through his word. And the question that I want to pose on this, the final Sunday, where we speak from what we've been reading together over the past week is a very simple question. And the question is this, are you ready? Are you ready? Are we ready? Are you ready? I don't know about you, but it's a question that is very often asked in our house. Especially when we're about to leave to go out for the day, or even worse, to go on holiday. I love going on holiday, I must admit. But one of the things I don't like is where we have to pack up and get everything into the car. One of the best holidays we had a, a few years ago is when we went to Spain as a family. And the great thing was that we could only take those very small cabin cases. Do you remember those? And they were small at the time. I think some now we can take a little bit bigger. But we had to pack everything that we wanted to take into those cabin cases. It was an amazing packing experience because you couldn't take the kitchen sink. You could just take those things. And the great thing was, just in case you're wondering, did we wear the same clothes every day for 10 days? We had a washing machine in the apartment that we were staying in. 
But it was, I, don't, I love going on holiday, but I don't like packing up. I don't like when we're rushing to get somewhere. And I ask the question, are you ready? And at times the response that comes back is a yes, quickly followed by in a minute. <laughs> yes, in a minute. I'm still trying to work out what that means. And maybe someone in our midst today could help me by explaining to me afterwards what on earth that means. Yes, in a minute. It's also a bit like another question that we ask in our house at times. Are you coming? The response quite often is this. Yes, in a minute. Again, I'm not sure what that means. But the question is, are you ready? Are we ready? And I truly believe that the desire of God, though, is that we, his people, live ready. And you may say, live ready for what? That we live ready for the return of Jesus Christ. We've just sung about it in that incredible song. I cast my mind to Calvary. As somebody said to me a while ago, I cast my mind to Calgary. I did not correct them because there was a new follower of Jesus. Well, I did correct them, but not like you just did. I didn't laugh. I just understood what they were saying. And I love the fact that just like babies, that newborn Christians come out with some stuff at times. But you know, the reality is that we believe there's coming a day when Jesus Christ is going to return to this world. And what a day that is going to be. You know, in actual fact, there's an Elam Pentecostal church that is made up about 500 churches here in the UK and connected with thousands of churches around the world that just over 100 years ago, that the beginning, the foundation of Elim was this, that we believe that Jesus Christ is our saviour, he's our baptizer, he's our healer, and he is our coming king. And all these years on, we still stand on that belief, that we believe that Jesus Christ is still our saviour. He is still our baptizer, he is still our healer, and he is our coming king. And the desire of God has always been that his people are ready. Be it ready for the first coming of Jesus or the second coming of Jesus. You know, many, many years before Jesus came to this earth for the first time, as God veiled in human flesh, it was talked about, it was prophesied that Jesus was coming. And I'm sure there were many people who began to doubt, is the Messiah ever going to come? Is the promised one ever going to come to this earth? Because years passed by. And therefore they began to wonder, is it really going to happen? I mean, the prophet Isaiah spoke in Isaiah 7 and verse 14 and said, Behold, the virgin will be a child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Isaiah was saying there was coming a day when the Messiah was going to come, where Emmanuel, God with us, was going to come into our world. For hundreds of years, heaven had been silent. Nothing was happening, and yet all of a sudden, something suddenly changed. And it changed because an announcement was made, and it was through the, through the angel Gabriel. And Gabriel visited Mary and told her of the imminent arrival of Jesus, the promised one, the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. The one of whom the angel has said would be great and the son of the most high God. And in many ways, the angel was saying to Mary, this is your time to be ready because Jesus is coming. And actually, you're going to be the one through whom you will give birth to the son of God, the most high God. I love Mary's response. She simply said, I am 
the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. In many ways, Mary was saying, I am ready. I am ready for the coming of the promised one. I am ready for Emmanuel. And as we go on to read in the Gospels, though, there were a lot of people who did not follow the example of Mary, and so were not ready for the Messiah, Jesus. Many of these people were the so-called religious people of Jesus' day. They knew what the prophets of old had spoken of what they said, and yet they missed out on their divine visitation because they were not ready. You may not realize it, but there are more references in Scripture that speak of the second coming of Jesus than his first. In actual fact, I'm informed that there's more cases of eight times that talk about Jesus coming for the second time, eight times more than his first coming. Biblical scholars have identified over 1,800 different references to the second coming of Christ in the Bible. One thing that is very clear from Scripture, that Jesus is truly coming again to this world. That Jesus is coming. I met somebody this morning who, who knew my dad and also knew my uncle. And they were both pastors in, in bygone years. And, and my uncle especially was a, an old-time Pentecostal preacher who kept on preaching about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes I think in the church that we've lost some of the emphasis on the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. And yet the book of Revelation that for some of us who've been up to speed have been reading over the past week and a half, we read time and time again there of the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God urges us to be a people who are ready for the return of Jesus. That God's desire is that we are a people who live ready. Because it goes on to proclaim in, in Revelation in chapter 20, if it proclaims it, sorry, not in, not in chapter 20, but right at the very end in verses 7, 12, and 20, Jesus proclaims through the angel, I am coming soon. I am coming soon. I am coming soon. And I have no doubt, because of what the angel, Jesus proclaims for the angel, that I am coming soon. I have no doubt that God wants us to live in a place of readiness for the return of Jesus. What a book the book of Revelation is. I wonder how, for those who have been reading over the past number of w couple of weeks, how you've been getting on in the book of Revelation, but it reveals so much of what is going to take place before Jesus returns. It reveals that we're going to live in some dark days, but the thing that we must never lose sight of is the one who wins in the end. As many people have read, have said over the years that we know who wins in the end, and his name is Jesus. He is the one who overcomes. And as it proclaims in chapter 21 of Revelation, there's going to come a time when God is going to make everything new and that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, that there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain what a glory we have to look forward to in Christ Jesus. That he's going to be a God who makes everything new. That he'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. That there'll be no more death. There'll be no more mourning or crying or pain. What a day that is going to be. It goes on 
to say in chapter 22, verse 5, that there'll be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord their God will give them light and they will reign forever and forever. What a day we have to look forward to. What a glorious and a wonderful day that we have to look forward to when God will put away the order of things now and he will restore all things unto himself. And the thing is that no one truly knows when Jesus is going to return. No one's going to know the day when he will renew all things unto himself. We can have all of our theories and we can have some good theories. But as Jesus proclaimed, no one knows the day or the hour when he will return. No one knows. Not even the Son, but only the Father. And that's why we need to live in a place where we are ready. Because Jesus said, I am coming soon. The thing that some people say is that that's all well and good. But Jesus proclaimed that some 2,000 years ago and he still hasn't come back. Is it really true? I am coming soon. But what Jesus was saying though, I believe can be interpreted in two ways. To come right away or to come suddenly. To come right away or to come suddenly. You know, whilst the return of Jesus may not be immediate, it is inevitable. It may not be immediate. I mean, right back then when, when Jesus proclaimed that I'm going to come again, that there were some of the apostles, the disciples, and they thought that they were not going to die before Jesus Christ came back again, but obviously they did. And yet we live in the reality that Je the return of Jesus is inevitable. And Jesus makes it very clear that it will be suddenly he said unto his disciples in Matthew 24, verse 42 to 44, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day on which your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you, almost, you also must be ready. Because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. There was no doubt that Jesus was saying here to his disciples, to the people of there, he was saying unto them that you need to be ready. Because if you know that a thief is going to come and break into your house, you would keep watch. And therefore, he's not referring to himself as a thief, because that's who the enemy is. But he's saying that there will be a sudden sense that I will come at a time when you do not expect me to come. Thessalonians 5 verse 2, the apostle Paul declared that the Lord will come like a thief in the night. He goes on to say in verse 4 that we are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Again, Peter proclaims in 2 Peter 3 and verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. They were saying, Jesus, Peter, Paul, they were saying that we need to be people who are not taken off our God. We need to be a people who live ready that Jesus could return at any moment of the day. That Jesus could return. I remember my dad telling stories of when he grew up as a, as a young lad. And, and he lived in the, in the light of the second return of Jesus. And they had a particular belief back then that not everybody holds today. But they had a particular belief back then. And one day my dad went to a place that... He thought he shouldn't go to. 
I was brought up in a time, like some of you were, where like to go to the cinema was like, no, 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 no. To go to a football match was a big no, 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 no. It's no, 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 no. That's right, television, no, 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 no. Thank God that God has released us from some of those things. I don't know if it's all good, but thank God God's released us from some of those things. But my dad went to the cinema, and it was just no, 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 no. And he got home, and there was nobody at home. And he sat on the door, and he cried, and he cried, and he cried. Because he thought that Jesus had come back and that he had been left behind. It was worse than that. He cried and he cried and he cried. Because his mom and dad were not at home. His two brothers were not at home. And he thought, man, I've really messed up. I have been left behind behind. Much to my dad's pleasure was that all of a sudden he saw his parents walking down the road and he gave them the biggest hug ever. I don't know if he ever revealed what he'd been doing, but he was so glad to see his parents. And we could smile at that, but you know what? We need to live in a place that we are absolutely ready. Romans 13, verse 11 and 12, the Apostle Paul proclaims this, and do this understanding the present time. The hour is already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. I want to say today that this is not a time for us to be spiritually asleep, but rather this is a time for us to be wide awake right now. For God's church to be wide awake. And that we do this by living in accordance with God's word. That we live in the light and we don't live in the darkness. That we live in the way that God wants us to live right now. That we are holy as God is holy. That we put aside the things that we know are the things that hinder us in our lives. That we live in accordance with the Word of God. That God's Word is a mirror to us. And the truth is that looking around today, it looks like 98% of us looked in the mirror before we left the house. I'm not telling you who the 2% are, but you know what I say? You open your gob, you get the job. Yeah, yeah. Sean said he'll tell you who the 2% are. But we look in the mirror and we do it to see what we see. But I guess the vast majority of us, when we looked in the mirror today, somebody just caught my eye, and you got a hair out of place, or maybe a hair that shouldn't be there. Oof, that hurt. You did something about it. And that's what God's Word does. It reveals things in our lives But it's not that we go around to everybody and say, you know what, have you seen this hair? You don't do that, do you? You do something about what needs to be done, something about. And God reveals stuff as we read his word, not in order to shame us, but in order that he can reveal something to us, that we can do something about it through through his word and by his Holy Spirit. And God wants us to be in a place of readiness that we are living out our lives in accordance with the Word of God. That we are people who are the people of God and therefore we we carry the character of God through our lives. 
I don't ask people today, are you a Christian? I say, are you a follower of Jesus? Because that's what we're called to be. We're called to be followers of Jesus that affects the whole of our lives. And if we are going to say, yes, I am ready for when Jesus returns, it means that we're following Jesus all the days of our lives. How long have you been a follower of Jesus? Keep on following Jesus. Keep on following him day in and day out, year by year, decade by decade, until he comes and takes us home. We need to keep on following Jesus. We do it by serving God in whatever way that we can. That's how we're ready. That we serve God with the the talents that God has given us. We serve God with the time that he's given us. That's how we live ready. That we don't bury our talent in the ground, but rather we, we serve God in such a way that there'll come a day when we hear those words, well done, thou good and thou faithful servant. We live ready by serving God. We live ready by letting our lives shine with the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. We live ready when we keep on sharing the hope that we have in Jesus with all those people that we can. I didn't plan to talk much about my dad today. But you know, I remember when my dad was so poorly near the end of his life. And we couldn't understand why my dad kept on living in that hospital bed. We couldn't, because he was in the house, it was in COVID, and he just lay in that hospital bed, and it was an awful time that we went through as a family. But you know, we kept on saying that maybe the reason why my dad keeps on breathing is because of the carers that keep on coming into our house and that we have the opportunity of being able to share Jesus in an appropriate way to the people that come through our doors. Whilst we have breath, we have to keep on sharing Jesus. And some people ask the question, why hasn't Jesus come to this earth yet? Why hasn't he returned in all his glory and all his splendor? It's because of this. 2 Peter 3 verse 8, it says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Listen, God wants everybody in Warwickshire to be saved. God wants everybody in Warwickshire to come into the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants the whole wide world to come to know him. You know, sometimes people say, how could a loving God send people to a lost eternity? Listen, it's never God's desire to send people to a lost eternity. His desire is that heaven would be filled with people who've been redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He is patient with you. He's patient with me. He's patient with His church. Because the mission here on earth has not yet been fulfilled. And you know the people are going to fulfill it? It's you and it's me. It's his church. As we share the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's when we live in a place of readiness that our cry can be the same as John at the end of the book of Revelation. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Somebody who's not ready will not be saying that. Again, when I was growing up, I was like, Lord, I want you to come back once I get a career. Lord, I want you to come back once I get married. Lord, I want you to come back once I've got kids. Listen, it's not like that. We need to live in a place that we are so ready, that we can cry out like John says, even so, come, Lord Jesus. 
Let it be, come Lord Jesus. It's the cry, it's the prayer of a people who are truly ready. I wonder today, what is your prayer? What is your cry right now? For some people in this place, it's like, Jesus, don't come back yet because I want my son or my daughter, my grandchildren to come into a saving knowledge of you. Well, maybe that's a good thing to say. But what are you doing in order to share Jesus? What are you doing to share Jesus? But God wants us to be a people That there's a cry that comes from our heart. In the world in which we live today, that cries, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. What a hope we have that Jesus is coming again. We have a glorious hope. We have a firm foundation And that's why we need to make sure that we are ready, that we're not like what happens in our house. Are you ready? Yes, in a minute. But actually we go, yes, yes, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And in just a few moments' time, we're going to truly have the opportunity to maybe put anything that is not right with God as we take communion together. And in so doing, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what Paul says. The team are coming back. He says, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There'll be a day when we don't take communion any longer because we're in direct communion with him. But until that day, we take communion and we proclaim his death until he comes. But the Bible says, and I'm not going to steal Sean's thunder away from this, but the Bible says, let a man examine his own life. And right now, I don't know every person in this place. I don't know if you can say with an assurance in your heart, I'm ready. But listen, you can be ready because of Jesus. It's not through your good works. It's not through your good deeds. But it's through the grace and the mercy and the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. I know Pastor Shaw won't mind if I just take this moment because I just feel it's right. Come on, let's bow your heads in prayer just for a moment. Spirit of God, thank you that you are here today. Thank you that you are present amongst us. God, I thank you for your heart for every single one of us today. A heart of love, a heart of grace, a heart of mercy. Father God, I thank you that this is really personal right now. It's between us and you. Father God, I pray that here in these moments that we would do as your word tells us to do. And God, that we would examine our own lives. Examine our own lives. this is what the Bible says, says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved. It says that you will be saved. 
And today I just want to give just a, an opportunity maybe for people in this place who've, who've never come into relationship with God through Jesus. I want to give you the opportunity to respond, to say, I want to confess that Jesus is Lord. I want to turn my life to Him because I want to be ready. I want to be ready. And if that's you, in just a moment, I'm going to pray. But if that's you, I'm going to ask you very quickly just to raise up your hand in this place. Is there anybody in this place right now? As I look around right now, is there anybody in this place? For the first time, God bless you. Anybody else today? If you feel like there's a tug going on in your heart right now, thank you, God bless you. There's something battle going on right now. Just respond to him. Thank you, God bless you. Thank you, God bless you. Father, thank you for these people that responded. God, I thank you that you never turn anybody away. But God, you embrace them and you draw them close. And God, I pray, God, that here in these moments, may they just know what it is for you to love on them in such a beautiful way, King Jesus. May they know what it is to know your cleansing, to know your forgiveness, to know your life. May they truly come to know you, King Jesus. And just in these moments, before we take of that little cup that represents the, the body of Jesus that was broken, the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. I want to encourage you to do business with God in these moments. As I said earlier, it's, it's a personal moment. It's not a place of condemnation, it's a place of cleansing. God's word is clear. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And this is a place of cleansing. This is a place of forgiveness. And I want to encourage you that when you are ready to take of those simple emblems, and it may be today the people in this place, and yes, it's right for you to do it on your own. It's for some people today, for whatever reason, you may feel in your spirit that right now you need to go and take it with somebody. I want to encourage you to follow the leading of God's Holy Spirit today. So Father, we thank you for these moments where we can commune with you and we can commune with each other. And God, I thank you that it's through the blood of Jesus that we are made ready and that we are made right with you. So Father, I pray, God, in these moments as we commune, may there just be such a sense of you washing us and cleansing us, Father, that we would be wide awake today, wide awake to what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So when the moment's right, I encourage you to take of that communion today. And we're going to a place of worship and adoration unto Jesus, the one who is the lover of our souls. Thank you, Jesus.